Ed Tech Director for the school district. Joining me tonight, Lynn Davies. The back here is the principal for Wicklow okay. Middle School. And Kat Kaiser is the instructional technology leader for the middle school. And they're going to jump in at certain parts later on in the presentation uh, to help give you some information and answer some questions. So first off, thank you very much for coming in, showing an interest in what this program is all about. Uh, and uh, you know, trying to get some more information about our one-to-one -one mobile computing initiative. I know there's some of you that need to get to a concert tonight at 7 o'clock over at the middle school. When you need to leave, just get up and leave. You're not going to bother me at all. If you think you have all the information you need, there's the door whenever you are ready, okay? Don't feel obligated that you need to stay to the end of this. Uh, we're going to try to keep our stuff to 30 minutes or less on the information after you. We're going to move rather quickly. Please just keep your questions, jot down questions if you have them, and then once we're done, we'll do a Q&A session. And I will sit here as long as it takes tonight to hopefully get all of your questions answered. With that in mind, I may not have answers to a couple of them. Now, a year ago, we sat with a bunch of middle school parents, and there was a whole lot of questions we didn't have answers to. Uh, we're a year through it now. Hopefully, we've got you know, answers to most of the stuff, but you might pop a couple things out, and I might just say, I'm not sure on that. We'll get back to you later in the summer. Let's get started. First question is, why are we doing this? And by the way, we're kind of catering to the fifth grade. How many of you are fifth grade parents right now? I would assume most of you. All right. So that's really, this is what, this is your night tonight. Uh, if you are a sixth or seventh grade parent, thank you for coming in. We will have a few tidbits of new information where the program's going to differ next year. But this is really for fifth grade parents. So. The question should be is, is, why are we doing this thing? Why bring in all these iPads and mobile computing and all this other stuff? So we look back at a classroom from back in the day, and we go back just, you know, just a couple years, the classrooms really haven't changed a whole lot. I mean, there's a classroom just a couple years ago, and not much has changed. The problem is that the world has changed, but our <coughs> classrooms have stayed stagnant. We have not changed with society and the business world and where the jobs are going to be. And we need to play catch up in education. So some goals that we have with the program are listed up here. 21st century skills. Those skills that we as adults didn't necessarily need to get a good job. But absolutely our kids are going to need. They are going to need to be able to manipulate information on the fly to transform it, to move it from place to place, much more so than we have to. So those are 21st century skills. Organization and communication, obviously, and engagement. Our kids are products of the computer age. We are not. Okay? We predate the computer age or the personal computing era. But our kids, to engage them in what we call being the digital native, meaning they have grown up from the ground up in this era, we need to engage their educational experiences in the same way. And we haven't been doing that. Some other ones that are floating out there, there's a push by the federal government to do away with all traditional textbooks by the year 2017. That's coming from the top down. Is it gonna happen? Don't know. We'll look at two, in 2017 and find out. But that push is coming nationally to get rid of all traditional paper textbooks by that year. There is a link here, and it's provided in your handout. I can also send it out digitally, too, if you want the whole thing. It's called the Digital Playbook. I invite you to search for it, look it up. Um, I'll give you just a quick little glimpse of it. We're not going to really talk about it tonight. It's something you may want to go through on your own. This is what it looks like if you want to look it up. It's a free downloadable PDF document. Um, we have it on our wiki service, and I'll show you how to get there. Uh, at the end of the presentation tonight, you can also download it for free. It's a federal government document. And it is basically kind of this mantra or mandate put out by the Federal, federal Department of Education. And basically where they see us going as a nation with regard to technology integrated education. Now I will tell you this, it's about 30 pages long. There are some pages in there that are really dedicated to teachers and professionals, but there's a section in there that addresses parents and why we should be concerned about these changes and why we need to make these changes. Again, a good piece for you to take a look at when you get a chance. 
So a couple numbers real quick, just to throw at you about how we are as a society shifting. And again, if you're a numbers person, you'll like this. If you hate numbers, sorry, I'll get through it really quick. Um, this is what most of us sitting in this room are used to, laptops and desktop computers. And here's the numbers of sales the last couple of years. And then you see where we're going with this as they are dropping. And if you follow the economy or you invest in computing companies, you're probably really hurting. <laughs> um, I hate to say that. Um, HP, Dell, all these computer companies, they don't know what to do right now because everything is shifting around them. And this is vanishing quickly. And they can't seem to sell a computer to save their lives. Um, because everything is going into this area right now. And you see some of the projected numbers. This was put out by the Gartner Group. Um, they've got a, about a 20 year track record of pegging the tech industry. Pretty good on estimates. So you see where those numbers are estimating out to. Okay, so a little bit of history of one-to-one -one programs. These are not new. Uh, when we started this a year ago, there was a whole lot of concern to parents. And rightfully so, change is often difficult, and you should be concerned about change and why we are changing. Um, but one of the questions I got asked last year was, you know, what is this one-to-one, -one and where did it come from, this brand new fangled thing? It's not new in education. It's been around for a long time. When I started my teaching career, I was in a one-to-one -one program in the late 90s. It was typically, though, traditional laptops. And it was very, very expensive. And so, it would cost about $1,600 per student back then, and mobility was still a problem, because even though we had laptops, uh, high-speed wireless wasn't really around yet. Now, we've had the move. The device has gotten cheaper, and right now we can do this for about $475 a student. So it becomes within the realm of possibility. We've done a lot of research into these programs. We visit a lot of other districts that are ahead of us in this game, uh, and their programs are well known. Um, they've been established for several years. We've got to thank Milton Middle School as a big um, kind of a district that we have mentored to or whatever. We have gotten a lot of information from them. And so they have some really nice one-to-one -one mo mobile programs. So we've been out there checking out what other people are doing and trying to do, bring the best practices back here to Whitmore. So the equipment, what, were, what will your students be getting? It's sitting here on the table over there, I invite you as you leave to check that out. So you know what your students will be coming home with in the fall. Um, it's Apple equipment. We as a district are invested in the Apple ecosystem. Um, they have a tremendous amount of materials and apps and iTunes U and digital books and <coughs> you name it, it's out there. Um, it's a huge, huge ecosystem for our teachers to tap and, and pull material from and get that digital material. So the kids will be getting iPad minis with OtterBox Defender cases. Um, it's a case that we were recommending. Cats got one holding up right here. Um, they're a little heavier, they're a little bit thicker, they're pretty robust. Uh, and basically, when we went around to the other districts, this was the one that people were picking. They're not without their flaws. We had found out that dirt tends to get trapped underneath the screen protectors. It's kind of a pain in the rear end. However, we also went and got 10 other cases this spring. We can't seem to find anything better that's as durable. And that's what the balancing is. What's going to protect this? Come on, kids are going to be kids, right? Stuff's going to get banged around. What protects it best? And this is what we found. Um, this year, for the entire year, we have only had two iPads out of 530 get completely destroyed to the point of being unrepairable. Um, that's a tiny, tiny little percentage of the total that are out there. So the other boxes have, have done their job, um, and they seem to work well in other districts as well. We'll keep seeking alternatives, but for now, that's what we're going to stick with for next year um, until we can find something that we can get around the screen cleaning <coughs> problem, gunk under there, that kind of stuff. Um, number of apps we're going to start the year with here and more, but these are some of the basics that we're going to use uh, on the iPads to start the year. <laughs> so training, last year, all the teachers at the middle school attended a four-day summer iPad Academy, very intensive training. Uh, I would say without a doubt, they all walked out saying their brains were fried at the end of it, but it was a really positive experience and gave them time to do lesson planning and prep for this year. We have continued to do in-service and ongoing training during prep days. 
uh, that the staff have as well as after school training that's offered for them. And then any new teachers that are coming into the middle school will attend a academy this summer to prep them and get them ready so they have all the skills they need uh, to begin applying this in the classroom. Kat is the current uh, holder of the ITL position, or Instructional Technology Leader. That is also available to all the teachers. And she is a resource for them where they can come to her and say, hey, I have this learning target, or this state standard, or this common core standard that I'm trying to address in my classroom. Here's what I intend to do. How do I integrate that now with the iPads? And that's what she's there for. And she's a licensed multi-year teacher with experience and has a lot of experience with technology. And so she comes in and then helps the teachers write the lesson plan and actually will come and co-teach with them to make sure you know, that technology isn't a barrier at all for that lesson. For students, they have an interesting first week of school. So your kids right now are used to coming to school, they're at one of the elementary schools, or coming in from outside the district, and they start school and they have you know, that first intro day that we all went through and they get used to everything, and then they start their classes. Well, we don't quite do that the same now at the middle school because we also have to get the technology done, and one of the lessons taught to us by the other districts was get it done quickly. Don't wait to spread it out over a whole bunch of weeks and then you're into October and you still don't have everything done. And so we learn from the mistakes of others. And so they will come into school the first week, and the first day is pretty you, the normal stuff. Where are my classes? Who are my teachers? What's my schedule? Blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. But then they jump right into what's called PBIS, Positive Behavior Intervention Systems. Okay. I get the acronym right? Okay, good. I was a little worried about the S. So they'll jump into that kind of training that sets the tone for the school, and Lynn can talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But then they will also spend a couple of days going through rollout, where they will actually get their equipment, and they'll get trained on it, and they'll get it all set up, and get their accounts prepped. But then they also go through a number of stations where their regular teachers, instead of teaching math class and science class, are going to be teaching stuff like digital citizenship, and proper internet use, and email etiquette, and app downloading, and what's inappropriate, and what is appropriate, and how should I use this tool? For education, how do I use Google Calendar and organize myself, and how do I keep track of all my assignments? That kind of stuff. So that's all taken care of during the first <coughs> week of school, and we get it out of the way and set everything on its course for the rest of the year. Management. If you have an older student that was already in the program this year, or you have talked to other families, this is what's changing for next year. Um, we are changing our management system for all of the iPads. It allows for us to have greater control of them. Uh, allows individual grade levels to actually determine what rights and privileges the students will have. I can't tell you what the exact restrictions, rights, and privileges are gonna be at this time because we're still determining that at each grade level. <coughs> so here was a challenge a year ago as parents were asking about this. A year ago, we only had two options. We could have controlled it this way with something called configurator, super restrictive, if I was that social studies teacher and I needed a new app for class, I literally would have to collect all of my kids' iPads back physically. They wouldn't be able to take them home at night. We would take them, hook them up to a cart, download the app, and install it on the iPads. Very time consuming, and very quickly, the teachers looked at me and said, are you nuts? We couldn't do that, not gonna happen. But the only other option was something called an open MDM, which, again, you don't need to know the acronym and all that stuff, but it's very minimal control. All we could do is impose a content restriction, say, well, the kids can download the anything they want as long as it's rated 13 or younger. That was all we could do. And there was nothing in between available a year ago when we started this. Now there is. And so this year, we will be shifting to a system <coughs> where, much like old student laptops, we can send down restrictions through the wireless system when they're here and restrict certain items. Now again, we're not sure what that's going to be. There has been some talk for sixth grade that we might start them in a much more restrictive environment. We will send them apps, our standard set at the beginning of the year, and then they won't be able to download anything. So we'll turn off the app store and the iTunes store for a while. And we're going to turn off some of the social media type stuff. So we're going to turn off like the video chatting and the text chatting. And then it will be up to their teachers to determine 
and come back to me and say, hey, Eric, sixth grade, we're four weeks in, time to start allowing them to download stuff. Now, they'll still have the content restriction, the 13 and under restriction on there. But once we turn that on, then they can download anything they want rated 13 and below. 13 and younger, I should say. Um, and then maybe they come back in December and say, it's time to turn on video chat, because there is a positive way to use that. And I've had a lot of parents come back and say, this is great. My kid can be sitting at my house working, but can collaborate on group work with other students through the video chat. Okay, but there, we all know there's also room for abuse too, right? And so that will be how we will determine those rights and privileges. The teachers will basically get together in their grade level teams, and then they will confer back to the technology department, and then we will grant those certain rights and privileges back. Okay, so it gives us a little bit more control. Do your children still need to become smart and intelligent users? And do we as educators need to be proactive with them and teach them the right way to use this equipment? Absolutely. Because we're certainly not going to leave the App Store off the entire year. That means they can't get any new material. And there's really great stuff out there. And so at a certain point, the grade level teams will determine it is that time to ship and open those, those things up. Okay. Now, through a discipline system, like a three strikes and you're out kind of thing, that will be spelled out and released to you later in August. We're talking a small minority of students, you know, a handful for the entire building. If they continue to abuse those privileges, the administration, so Ms. Davies and her partner, Brian Borden, who helps out over there, Dean of Students, they will be able to go in and individually restrict. But again, that's going to have to be done through a very structured discipline system where your child has been given, you know, Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. You know, it's the same thing as any classroom discipline. It hasn't changed with the technology. You know, they just have a shiny new little iPad in their hands. Hope that makes sense. And again, if you got questions, ask them at the end. Happy to answer them. Funding has not changed. The regular district budget is going to take care of funding the purchase of the equipment and then the basic apps that they need to get by, uh, kind of thing. We will take care of that. Um, much like textbooks, if you damage a textbook or your child damages a textbook, you are responsible for the repair of that textbook or replacement. Same goes here. You will be responsible for if a screen cracks or a button gets ripped off or something like that or shatter a case or whatever. In that packet I gave you are tentative prices. <coughs> I am still waiting for some of our vendors to come back to me with finalized <coughs> what we call contracted rates. Because what I tell them is that they need to keep to these rates all the way until <coughs> excuse me, wow, June 30th of next year. And so I'm still waiting for a couple of those contracts. So there's a little bold statement at the top there that says they'll be finalized in August 2014. And I will send them back out to you through the mass messaging system once they're finalized. I don't expect they're going to change. If you have seen this list from this current year, they've actually gone down a few dollars, which is nice. All they save them money. So if you would have to replace, say, a charging cable or something like that, we have found different vendors to get the price down a few dollars on each one of those items. Okay, so a couple of classroom examples. How is this actually applied in the classroom? And then what are some things like e backpack and Google Calendar you might have heard your kids talking about if they have middle school friends? So time for me to turn this over to Kat Kaiser a little bit. Okay, I'm going to start with Google Calendar. Um, when we got the iPads in the kids' hands, we also started our Google initiative where we kind of all, all of the students got their Gmail addresses and um, we started to use Google Docs and all that good stuff. So what we decided as the middle school is that each staff member in the middle school has a calendar. And the expectation at the middle school is by the beginning of the, or the, beginning of the week, by Monday morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, the weekly calendar is set for the middle school teachers. So I have an example of a um, student's calendar right now. And on the left, you can see, these are all of the teachers that that child sees throughout the day. Each color coordinates with the class. So for this week, this is the homework that that kid is going to have. Um, so you can look at it at a glance week by week. You can do it by month. You can do it by day. And when you click on the class, that's this picture up here, you can see greater detail about that homework assignment. 
So for Thursday, May 29th, they have to complete their Middle East review. And this is kind of just a nice, easy way since the students all have the technology, they can see you know, day by day what their homework is. Um, we've also worked, um, found an app called Calendmob that the students have been using. And the, the nice thing about the Calendmob app is it doesn't need Wi-Fi. So the students at the end of the day, they open up Calendmob and that's all they needed to do is open it up. And then if they go to grandma's house, if they go to the park, if they go to a home and they don't have Wi-Fi at home, they can still access that calendar. They can still see what their homework is. So this is an expectation of every teacher in the middle school. So every student is then going to be able to have this calendar. Um, I know a lot of the parents that I've talked to have really appreciated this because parents can also subscribe to these teachers' calendars. We'll give you a guide and handout in the beginning of the year. If you want to subscribe to, you know, maybe it's math your child, you know, isn't getting the homework in, you can subscribe to that calendar and actually get updates on when homework assignments are due. Um, being a classroom teacher, sometimes plans change. You put something up there on Monday. By Thursday, you didn't get that far. The teachers will update this. So, you know, it's not just set in stone on Monday. They'll update it as time goes on. But if you look at it on Monday in general, you should be able to get a pretty good, you know, view of what's going on. This has also been really nice for um, kids who have been absent. So that's one of the initiatives with the one-to-one. -one. The other one is e-backpack. We have um, a subscription of e-backpack. Some teachers um, use it more than others. It kind of depends on your grade, grade level. But I think all teachers in the building are using it for some things. So once again, this is an app, or it is web-based, so you can go to it on the computer or the iPad. And when the students sign in, they see they have all of these options. They have a mini little calendar up there as well. So if something is assigned in e-backpack, it tells us right there. And then on the left, just like in Google, are all of that kid's classes. The other really nice thing about e-backpack is it has this thing called My Files, which is like a mini flash drive. So they can, uh, at home on their computer, they can be working on an assignment and save it in My Files and then open it up on their iPad. They can be, you know, start working on documents. If they don't finish it in class, they can save it on this My Files and then us turn it in a little bit later. So we found that we've liked a lot of the features of eBackpack. We've also found that, you know, there's been glitches with it. If you've talked to anybody that, um, students at the middle school, sometimes the app crashes, sometimes the kids turn it in and it deletes it. Um, we've found ways to restore it and I can honestly say throughout the year it has gotten better. eBackpack now works with Google, so anything that assigned in eBackpack to that child automatically gets put on their Google Calendar without teachers or anybody doing anything, which is a really nice feature. And they're um, just released, they're coming out with something new for us to try this next year. So we're going to give it, we're going to give it a go next year again. Um, this has really helped us become, and I don't want to say paperless, but it's helped us use a lot less paper. Um, for example, Spanish, you know, Mrs. Kapp would hand out over and over vocabulary sheets to the students, you know, just to try and get them to remember. Now she places them in a backpack, they don't have to lose them. She doesn't have to make 600 copies of the same adjectives over and over again. So it's been really helpful. Mm -hmm. In here, you said the, one of the, the response back on one of the things that the information you're seeking is available to our, in our parent portal, which... Yes, all parents then, in the beginning of the year, we're going to give you a parent code. And so you would go to, um, on the Whitman homepage, there's a, under parents, there's an e-backpack tab, I believe. And you would go there and the, your child will then give you a code. And that will give you access to all of their classes. Um, I caution this. To let you know that not every teacher is putting every assignment in e-backpack. Some teachers have found that, that they just like give, um, giving out assignments in Google. They will email their kids. They'll make their own email list and they'll email things that way. Um, so that is a caution. I don't want you to think that every assignment your child has is going to be in e-backpack. It's one of the resources that we found very helpful for the one-to-one. -one. Do you have anything to add to that? Not really. There's one part in the Q&A section way at the end of it, a parent asked a question with more information about the parent portal, um, about that e-backpack's responses there, and they wanted it to be even more robust than it is, they have not added those features yet. And, and again, the explanation is all in there. If you have additional questions, just ask when we get to the question and answer section after cast up. 
Um, and I'm just going to take you through the couple grade levels. I get to be in all of the classrooms um, majority of the time, so I've seen some really amazing things. Not only have the teachers been using the iPads for content creation for a lot of projects and movies and some great things, they've been using it for um, more inquiry-based projects and getting the kids to like dive in and do their own learning, so that's been pretty amazing. Um, in sixth grade, the students used their iPads to create an ABC book um, regarding <coughs> from ancient Greek vocabulary, I believe. And the other thing that they use is Google Quizzes. The sixth grade is really latched on to Google Forms and Google Quizzes, so they will, on a weekly basis, give just a little short quiz using Google Forms. You'll see that each teacher's out there, so they create one um, quiz within the grade level, they email it to the kids, and the kids take the quiz on their iPad. It's not a grade that's gonna go on the grade book for a big, huge project. It's something to help them review key things they've worked on, and the nice thing is is it automatically grades it and sends the kids back an email that tells them their score, which ones they got wrong, what the right answer was. So it's a quick, easy way to kind of assess the kids, make sure that they know what they, you know, what they need to know for the test. It's a place they can go back and review as well. So that's one of the features of Google that we have been using. Um, seventh grade, seventh grade social studies and science textbooks are on the iPad, so the kids don't have to carry around their textbooks anymore. Sixth grade science and social studies are also on the, on the iPad. Um, seventh grade um, social studies units are based on the world geography, and they used to have these binders with every um, country and continent's name on it, and the students would have to grab and check out the binders and go through to get information. Now, for 99 cents, and actually it was 50 cents because we got a half bought, um, they have an app, a World Factbook app, and they can, you know, if they're studying Brazil, the very first thing the teacher's gonna do is say, go to the app, find five things interesting about Brazil, and the next thing they're gonna do is they're gonna say, go to Google Earth, look at, look at Brazil, find me one attraction by looking at it that you find interesting. So before the teacher even gives them any information about what they're studying, the kids are actually searching it out on their own, where, you know, then they'd have to go to the library, find a book on Brazil, or actually look at that binder that the teachers had. So this has proven to be just worth it for me. I mean, just to see the kids, oh, Mrs. Fraley, Mrs. Fraley, I saw this awesome thing in Brazil, this monument, what is this? And then they click on it, they look it up, and, you know, Mrs. Fraley has said, all of a sudden a half hour's gone by, and I didn't even start my lesson yet because that was just a warm-up, and, you know, but I, you just go with it because that's what the kids are interested in. And that's when they really learn, is when all of a sudden you caught their attention. Um, some other things the seventh grade doing is, is doing is each student has their own web page. And language arts, um, the language arts teachers have found that um, getting each student a web page using Google is where they do their daily writing assignments. So the first thing every kid does when they come in the classroom is they open up their iPad. Mr. Seamers and Mrs. Drills have a writing prompt on the board, and so they date it, and then they go through, and they comment on whatever the writing prompt is. And so then the teachers can kind of go back and look, instead of collecting every single you know, notebook to make sure the kids are doing it right, they glance at their web pages. They also have a list of what they've been reading, and they can publish all of their papers that they write here as well. And it's nice because then they can actually <coughs> take them home, you know, show them on, online what they've been doing. So the seventh grade has really enjoyed doing that. And I think the web pages is um, something that more of the grade levels are going to be doing, not just the seventh grade next year, because the seventh grade really found that useful. And lastly, eighth grade, um, same thing. The NOVA elements, same thing as the seventh grade. Um, periodic table, all of a sudden the eighth grade teachers found this app. Well, not only is it the periodic table, but you click on the element, it has a video about the element. It has actual, you know, um, and I'm not a science person, so forgive me if I get all this wrong, but it has the um, electrons and the neutrons and it has it all spinning and it's, it's super cool and it was free. So now the kids are, you know, the first thing we're gonna learn about is carbon today or whatever it is, they click on the element, they spend some time reading it, watching a movie, they do that at home, and then, you know, the lesson is that much more powerful. So that's just some of the things. And much like the rocket presentation you saw, Kids, we did take a couple iPads tubing, 
we got an app that told us um, the miles per hour, so when they went down the hill, first they had to figure out their, the miles per hour they went on their own, and then they got to take an iPad down the hill and see if they were anywhere close. We got up to like 37 miles an hour. It's pretty exciting. <laughs> and lastly, global languages. Um, Mrs. Kepp, the Spanish teacher, has been, you know, she has used these iPads probably the most in the building just because she doesn't have a textbook. So the apps for the kids to learn Spanish, all of the different projects that she could have them do. She had them take, this is um, actually in French, but the Spanish teacher did it as well. They had adjectives. So you had a picture of yourself and you put adjectives that describe yourself. Um, and it was just a cute little app. It took 15 minutes to do. The kids worked on their adjectives. It was, it was exciting. And then she just did a project where she gave the kids the option about six options of how they could present verb conjugation. She had some kids still do paper and glue projects because we still allow that. Not everything needs to be done on the iPad. They can still use paper and make posters and all that good stuff. So she had some of that. But then she had some kids go way above and beyond and make, and I'm just going to show you a minute because this is just too cool. She decided, oh, I want to make a movie. So he created this movie. So just to wrap up real quick, um, where can you get additional information as we roll on into summer here and then we start forgetting about this stuff and then all of a sudden mid-August is going to hit and we go, whoa, hey, middle school's happening and iPads are happening and all that stuff. Keep an eye out in August for a mass email message coming from me. That will have updated information. It will have the final price sheet just in case there are you know, charges for replacement of equipment, that kind of stuff. That will be in there. We'll talk more about the exact procedure and exact dates that we're going to do rollout. And rollout is when the kids will actually get the equipment and go through their training. Um, so look for that in about the mid-August time frame. Another place to look is the Whitnell website. Um, there's a section that Kat Kaiser has been working on, and I've been tossing up a bunch of information. So if you take a look. Whether you're on the district site, the middle school site, or the high school site, if you go under parents, I scroll down here, sorry. If you go under parents, there's a link that says one-to-one -one iPad program. This is our primary site for updating information. So anything new as we get, it will go up here. Um, and you can see I just was doing some updates here, May 27th, kind of change that date as things get updated. Lots of links, you can come check this out on your own. I look for it, but there really isn't anything else that you don't have in that packet in front of you. And I don't like killing trees, but I need it for tonight's meeting, but then we try not to do this anymore. Okay, so all the information you have in your packet, you can also find here under the middle school program. And you'll see it get updated as we go, but then again, I'll send it out by email as well. Um, the wiki site, let me flash back here. Um, this is another place you can go. Here's the link, it should be in your packet as well. Uh, and you can come here, this is open, it does not require a password, and it gives you instructions in the packet how to go here, but you basically come here, go to the uh, WMS one-to-one -one mobile computing program, and all the information again is here, and we're updating this, although I'm hoping in the next year to get rid of this, and we'll just switch over to the school's website and, and put everything up there, okay? You have three of us here. You have the principal, you have the district person, you have the technology leader. Um, we're done with our part of the presentation, folks. And so if you've got a place you need to be, you can go, but if you've got questions, 
start sending them up our way. Yes. Um, just to be clear, something like a battery replacement here is 75 hours. Correct. Is this all new equipment, or are the batteries new, or like the Wi-Fi? If something goes wrong with that, this looks like a price list that we're responsible for. Right. So the iPads are going to be a year old. They'll be the eighth grade ones coming down to the sixth graders, so to speak, unless we have more sixth graders, in which case we're buying new ones. Batteries should not be an issue. They got three year lifespan on them. Um, that should not be a problem. We're generally talking damage where the kid has, you know, whether by accident or intention, smashed something. Those are the only repairs we've had so far, and the only ones we intend to see. Now, if a battery goes dead, we're going to know if it was from damage or just from use. If it's from use, we take care of that. Now, if the battery is broken in half, it's a wafer that can split. Yeah, I get that part. Because if the thing, the whole iPad's been split, then we would charge. I understand, but if you just if all of a sudden the battery goes or it's going because over time right. it wasn't you know charged properly, right. that's something we, we take care of. Time. Yeah, we take but, care of that. But you said you guys determine that, so right. okay. Right. So we can still get stuck for charges along the way. Yeah, but again, it would have to be through a breakage type situation. You know, and when the battery's been smashed, that's really. What's the uh, incident rate that you have of, of kids hacking the iPad? Uh, hacking in terms of? Well, in terms of uh, getting past security features and like that. Okay. Um, so far, it's been zero because we had minimal restriction or anything else this year. I mean, there really wasn't anything to hack other than the content restriction, which we've had nobody get through. Um, what would happen is if they had managed to find a way to wipe that out, it would have also barred them from our network. So basically what happens if the content restriction goes, so, so does the ability to connect to the Windmill network and everything, that would be an obvious choice. You know, we'd see that um, within there. I can't honestly tell you once we go to this MDM system that we're gonna move to. Basically it's brand new, we have no experience with it. Um, a couple districts have been in uh, with an MDM program already this year, we're piloting them out. Uh, what those, do is if the kid gets past those, I don't know call it a restriction, but the assignment to this you know, system of management, it notifies the school district personnel. And basically says such and such iPad, and it actually sends the serial number, has been removed from the system. Basically saying go track that kid down and figure out what the heck they're doing. The other, sorry, I wanted to follow up. Is that, um, I have a, my son has an email address and I monitor it and it, I, I, I find it frustrating that I don't, I can't monitor what's happening on all the Google other things mm -hmm. um, unless, unless I've missed something that I needed to sign up for. Um, but it's kind of like I, I monitor every, everything that comes in and out on every device, every everything, and I can't monitor what's happening through his Google account and that's where he wants to go use all the time because right. that's what teachers are asking him to and all that. Right. Is there any way we can have, we can get on their there? Accounts? There isn't other than that you should be able to ask your child for their password, you know, and, and as a parent. I'm not having a problem with that, I just, I just yeah. therefore I have to then go act, search it down. I, I, every, right. other th every other thing I have emails me when he's any activity going on. Right, yeah, there's no, there's no administrative interface that we can give you access to kind of thing. Um, you know, how much oversight do we have of it? Not much, unless a parent says, you know, I, we have a problem or a concern, you know, in which case then we go in, but we go in through the same way. We can just see their passwords, so it's the same thing. I'm logging in as the student then to see what activity has been going on within there. Okay. Yes? Obviously this, there's, there's so many different sources where they can gather information from. Mm -hmm. Say for something like history, Who's validating this information as authentic and accurate? Yeah, who does we, that? We talk about a lot about that, about you know, differentiating, and we went through the same thing just with different materials. What's a primary source? What's a secondary source? Where should you go? Like most of the kids, they <laughs> want to go to Wikipedia. The first thing we tell them is, don't ever go to Wikipedia. <laughs> it could be from Joe Schmo down the street, you know. Um, and so that's just part of, and I don't even really want to call it digital citizenship. That's just part of learning to research properly. That the teachers work with them on a daily basis. Where you know, can you find a primary source? If you're looking this up, you know, the National Geographic Society is probably a good place to go during a geography lesson. Wikipedia, not so good. You know, and that's just part of the instructional Or process. even on the in, what's being used for instruction. Like, of course, with a textbook, you can say, I'm using this book. 
I can look at it, right. you know, and go from there. How do we know, or, you know, what's being, the content that's being <coughs> used to teach with? Right. Or is that going to be part of something we can access? Some of it is. Whether it be lesson plans or whatever. Right. Well, it's still up to the, you know, individual professional teacher to develop that material, and they, okay. you know, we got to look at them and say, this is your job. You better know what you're doing. You know, to find, a, again, that primary source information and everything that they aren't just pulling it out of the air, so to speak. So and it's not the same in a grade? Like, they don't use the same resources depending on the teacher? We so have it's not like an online textbook, right? Is that what you're kind of asking? It's coming from an online well, textbook? Well, it's kind of like just, uh, one of my, a, sort of a concern is, okay, the teacher also has sources that yeah. they can go get for free and stuff. Yeah. How do I know that that source is yeah. even accurate? Yeah. Right? So is it I don't, like, I they have online anything. textbooks that they're using? Some of them do, some don't. Okay. And so paper textbooks aren't going away, at least for the next couple of years yet. Some teachers are stuck with it. In some cases, we've had access to digital versions already from purchasing the textbook. And so we have converted those into formats that can be used on the iPad. So that's what Kat was talking about, science and social studies, right? Mm -hmm. Who we did that for. Um, and those are basically the exact same paper textbooks they have sitting in a storeroom right now are available on the iPad. Um, we also have some you know, primary primary source type stuff we've done through Follett, which supplies all the library books and everything. Um, they're also a big textbook manufacturer, and so we're pulling in some of that stuff. Now, does that mean that they have a digital textbook for every class? No, it does not. The other thing to keep in mind is the teachers develop their lesson plans based on our standards, state standards and common core standards, so they're looking for materials that will complement those things. They're not just pulling things off the web, you know, okay, we're gonna learn about something in biology this week, so we're going to pull these things. They're basing all their lessons on the standards. The technology is a tool to support that. So they're using that as a tool. If you think of a textbook as a tool for learning, it's the same thing this iPad is used as a tool. Many of the examples Kat talked about were things the teachers were already doing in their classroom, but they found complementary apps to support the learning in their classroom via the technology. We did spend, Eric mentioned um, the digital textbooks. We did, the, um, part of my job also is the library budget. We did spend a good amount of money this year on nonfiction resource materials for our teachers. So what I did is I went to every grade level meeting and every subject and I said, hey, I found these 20 books that support your content area and what your standards are. Do you want me to purchase them? And the awesome thing about these books is that every kid in the school can open them at the same time. They're unlimited resources. So it's just like, or so you know, it's just like having of textbooks, and our teachers are still using our textbooks. Um, our math teachers are still using our big math textbooks. The kids have gotten very savvy. They take pictures of the pages, and instead of carrying the math book home, they have a picture now in their camera roll. Um, you know, they've uploaded our math teacher, our eighth grade math teacher, uploaded the work worksheets into e, um, e backpack and has the kids do all of the work in a notebook. So they don't have to bring the worksheet home. They use the iPad then as that actual worksheet sheet and they have to show their work in their, in their um, notebook. So we've asked this last year that our teachers not totally flip and forget what they've been doing in the past. Just integrate as little as possible or as much as you want with this iPad. And so some of them have chose to keep doing a lot of the same things that match the Common Core and others have chosen to go a little bit further and find um, reliable resources to, to incorporate in the classroom. What kind of internet access are they given? And then are you, so I'm assuming they have Safari. Mm -hmm. And then do they have like complete internet access then? Here, everything's filtered according to federal law. Okay. C CEPA Act, Child Internet Protection Act, have you ever heard of that? So everything's filtered here. Now, once they go off site, responsibility goes to the family. And actually federal law was changed just a couple of years ago to make sure that that would be possible. Because obviously we can't monitor what they're doing at your house or wherever you may go with those devices. So we take care of that here now. Is it perfect? No. We spend a lot of money on web filtering every year. We have one of the best ones so, out there. Okay, so we have iPads at home, mm -hmm. and my husband and I have access codes for Safari. So if you need to look something up or so forth, then we have to access it, you know, for you. Mm -hmm. But is that going to be something I can do with this iPad? Otherwise, my kid would probably be on forever. Right. So. That's, again, that how you manage things at your house is, is up to you, but we are gonna say one thing, there can be no pin codes put on these iPads. You know, we need to be able to 
you know, as the administrators within the building or the district level, we need to have direct access to that iPad. We only had one incident this year, but it created a huge problem. And the parents kept saying, you know, you're restricting my kids. And we're like, no, we didn't. We never ever put this pin code in. There'd been no reason for us to do that. So and basically, we have to take the iPad. Away. Yes, because I mean, there's no way that yep. they how you manage the use within your house is solely on you. And so, if you need to physically pull that away, that's what you do. So you can't set like uh, yeah. hours a day or anything. Like that. Yeah. No. What about during breaks, like spring break? Do they get? Do they have to leave them at school during those periods? No, keep them the whole they they can come home at that time. Again, uh -huh. that's something where you determine that. Now, in some cases where we have had behavior issues, if we need to, re you know, restrict them and keep them at school, we will. We're trying to avoid that. I mean, mm -hmm. again, we're trying to teach ownership and responsibility type thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we have done that in a few cases. Did you take them back over summer? Or no? We are taking them back over summer. Now that may change. In fact, the interesting part is I had two current middle school parents call me between the end of the school day today and this meeting, asking a few questions, and that, and they were both saying the same thing. Can we keep this over the summer? And at this point I said no, um, for no other reason than we don't know of another district with a big widespread one-to-one -one program who has let the kids take them home over the summer. I have on a calendar in September to go visit a district that is allowing it to happen this summer for the first time. And I wanna see if there's a problem because some other districts that did laptop programs earlier on, they found that the breakage and loss rate went up tremendously during the summer. So we're trying to be a little cautious and yes, we're pulling everything back this summer and then we'll reevaluate after we see what's happened in another district. We'll let them fight the fire first. So, yeah. Will a sixth grader get the same iPad back for the seventh grade they used the sixth grade? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the whole EVAC Google Calendar. I know that our teacher now in fifth grade uses Edmodo, and they have to check Edmodo, and sometimes Google docs for their homework. Yep. Um, but does that mean in middle school you're going to have to check Edmodo, and you're going to have to check Google Calendar, and you're going to have to check your backpack? At a minimum. I was gonna, uh, you will check Google Calendar, and that will then tell you where to go for your. We have teachers at the middle school that use Edmodo, Google Calendar, and the backpack. All three of them, plus they have it written on their board at school. They, you know, th they decided that the more places, the better. You know, you don't have to go to each and every one of them, but they put it out everywhere. But the one place you, the our students and our teachers are instructed to go first is Google Calendar. So everything will be on Google Calendar. Everything, whether it's in eBackpack or Edmodo, it has to be in eBackpack. Or I'm sorry, it has to be Google Calendar. And that we're going to make a standard across. So it's something that will get ingrained, and we are going to work hard to make that a standard from grade six all the way through 12. So now as we're rolling this program for the first time up into the high school this year, <coughs> we're giving the, the high school staff the same requirement we did the middle school staff. If you do nothing else this year, you will use Google Calendar as your central communication place to post all assignments. That helps. They haven't really done that this year, have they? At the high school? Middle school. Not at, at the middle school they were supposed to. There, there were some bumps and, you know, um, been implementation been um, glitches, and, but the expectation is that we're all using it. Um, but, you know, this was our first year, so it wasn't perfect. The parents were confused. You know, this the backpack thing, where do I find my kids' homework? And uh, so the consistent will be Google Calendar is where all of the assignments will be listed. And like Kat said, some teachers may use the backpack for things, so they will be instructed to go to the backpack for the worksheet. Um, but Google Calendar, if you're if you want to check up, you know what what homework does my child have this week? That's where you need to go. Yeah. And then you may, you know, your student may show up all of a sudden in the middle of November, let's say, and say, hey, I'm doing a new project for the next week or two in something called school schoolology. I can never pronounce that correctly. Schoology. Schoology. Thank you. <laughs> Very good, yes. And I know at the high school that's been a really big um, app that's been used a lot and it provides a lot of different you know, learning type situations that the kids can use. And so your kid might come in and say, hey, we're using this now. That still doesn't mean it's not gonna be in Google Calendar. That again, it will have to be posted there, but it may say something, you know, we are doing you know, skill-based learning in Schoology. Pronounce that correctly that time? Thank you. <laughs> For the next two weeks, you know, and, and so there will be a notice there, that kind of thing. But they could jump into other apps to, you know, to do various projects, I guess. Is there, is there a 
concerted effort or anything at the end of the year to uh, help the kids get their content off of Google Drive and iPads and everywhere so that, so that you have something to walk away with at the end of the year? Yeah, well, right now, it's, I mean, we're going through this for the first time, the, the kind of cleanup process, so to speak. Um, and it, even some kids hit me up last week when I was at the middle school about, am I going to lose all my stuff, blah, blah, blah. So there's two things where they're going to keep it in storage that will follow them from year to year. One is the Google Drive for Education that we have set up. And the other one then is eBackpack. There's a section called My Files in there. That will not get wiped out from year to year. It's, it's basically that big filing cabinet. And so what we just did about a week ago was put out notification to all the teachers saying, please follow these steps and have kids move any and all material, organize it into either my files, because there's other places they could put it in e-backpack, but that will get wiped, it gets cleaned during the summer. Tag it with the year so they learn how to organize. Right, you know what, it basically it's like a file, you create folders and organize by subject and you know, year if you want. Actually, I believe it does it by year anyway, automatically. It does it by year, and our kids are, yep. they've gotten, the wild ones I've seen, they've got all their subjects, they've been really good. There's a yep. few, you know, couple kids that needed a little help organizing, but. That'll, that's going to be a big effort this year, you know, getting kids to upload pictures and not all 3,000 that the selfies that they took, but, you know, which important <laughs> pictures do you want to keep? And, yeah, and this is a change for us because within this district, we have never retained student data over the summers. So even if we go back to a traditional lab, computer lab situation and signing in and that kind of thing, saving your stuff and went to a server and stuff, that was always cleaned out every year. So this is our way to start maintaining some of these files. So if they need to do portfolios for college or something, they become more important when they get to high school. You know, and that's a, what a lot of the high school teachers have been asking for is, we need to retain this stuff. Come on, tech guys. Let's shift the way we're thinking here. And so we're doing that. So even the traditional logins, too, on the traditional computers, we are retaining that information now year after year so kids can then reassemble when they need it. You know, college applications, art school, vocational school. I know what Dropbox is. Mm -hmm. Is that what eBackpack is? That's what Google or Drive is. I, yeah, they both. yeah, Google Drive and Dropbox could be the same okay. darn thing, just with a different name. They work the same, they look pretty much the same. Um, and, and so that's, yeah, if you've used Dropbox, then you could jump into Google Drive and use it with no problem. And that's one of the places kids can save their stuff. eBackpack is even like Dropbox. The only nice thing about eBackpack is when the kids start the year, their eBackpack is already set up with all their teachers, all their classes. It's kind of just handed to them um, and organized for them. Yeah. So, yeah, they're all the same. When we went through the sales pitch for eBackpack, it was kind of, they even, they even termed it as a Google Drive or a Dropbox with an educational focus slapped over the top of it. And it's exactly like Kat said. It's a big storage area, but it draws from Infinite Campus. And so literally once the kid's schedule is programmed in for the year, that's what shows up on eBackpack. It syncs up and there's their core schedule and everything where they can drop stuff into it. Is the My Files part of the backpack uh, an online thing, or is it in the uh, memory of the device? Uh, it's an online, but then it also stores within the device as well. And so it has a sync to it. And so that's one of the things, one of the questions was asked uh, last year, if any of you are concerned, what if I don't have Wi-Fi at home? And that's where eBackpack helps bridge that gap a little bit. Students can download their materials. The teacher has a couple worksheets or something like that they're assigning or whatever. They can download that material into eBackpack, work on it at night, make changes there, it's saved on the device itself. They come back to school in the morning and then it syncs back out to eBackpack. So it syncs itself? Yes. Although it does not sync unless, if the kid has to turn something in, if it's an actual assignment, like a turn in assignment for a grade or something, that the student must mark as ready to. All right, hey teach, here it is. They'll figure it on there way before we figure it out. <laughs> yes. So I have a student that's going to be a junior this year. They're getting an iPad. Are they the same as these? Um, they have the higher resolution screen, but from the outside, you wouldn't notice a difference other than. And then is the presentation on Thursday, I guess, the same as this? Yeah, I, I wouldn't come to that. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a lot like that with WHS slapped in a bunch of places. <laughs> so once they graduate high school, will they be still able to access that backpack account? They will not. So they need to, if they want, if they want the stuff, they can dump it. And there are ways, they're like Google Drive actually has a mass export feature. Um, it, you literally, a couple clicks, if you have a flash drive, a big enough one, and it just dumps all your files right onto that flash drive. So 
there is a way for you to get that information out. Yes. Yeah, and that's part of the reason why we chose it. There were other systems out there, but they were sometimes tied to only the iPad or only web browsers. This one has an actual app on the iPad to make it easier to access, so it's just click eBackpack and you're in. They already have their own laptop. Mm -hmm. to get the iPad. Yep. It's much easier to work on the laptop to do a project than to do it on the iPad and transfer that. Into yep. The so if I'm here and I'm a middle school student, and I come down here, that uh, my student has commented to me that is on uh, Google Docs. Not all the features are there that they use within making the Word doc. Correct. They're getting better. I will say this. Yeah. With Every, I've given up Microsoft Word just because I think that's my job is to make sure that I know how to use Google Docs pretty well and so I can teach it. And I have found, I swear every week I find something new that Google Docs has the ability to do. It isn't perfect and it's, you know, it's not a replacement for Word, but for something free, you know, for teaching for 10 years and having kids email me, you know, papers because they didn't, they, you know, they don't have Word at home because it's expensive. So this is just a feature that I wish we would have had 10 years ago that Know, bridges that gap that everybody has some sort of word processing for free um, that they can use. But yeah, it, it's not exactly the same. So here's the question that he was asking. Let's say, here's the typical one that does happen. Your son or daughter comes home on a Friday and they do have some homework and it's a worksheet in e-backpack and they go, uh, well, mom, I forgot my iPad at the school in my locker. If you have another internet capable device, and it really doesn't matter what it is, um, eBackpack has said computers going back about six years and forward and newer. As long as you have a web browser and internet access, you can come to this link and they can just use their name and password and sign right in. And they'll see all the stuff they see on their iPad. So it doesn't matter if it's in a Microsoft or, or a PC format as opposed to Apple? Doesn't format. matter. That doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's plat platform agnostic would be the ta technical term in there. Okay. It doesn't matter. Now the only thing that might be a limit is if they need the touch capability. You know, if it's that type of an activity that requires them to touch the screen and maybe write on the screen or something like that. But typically, anything they do, a lot of that stuff, they can open up in uh, Adobe Reader on your home computer, make changes on Adobe Reader, and then they save it back to here. But that can be done, again, on a Windows PC, you know, a Mac, just about anything. Could they download, I know it's like the new um, Office 2013, you can download it on one laptop or, or you know, personal computer and one tablet. Could, mm -hmm. could you download something like that onto the iPad? Not. Or, or would that be against the policy? Well, the eBackpack app is free because we have a we have a subscription to it. So that they'll get on all their iPads. Mm -hmm. They could, even if you had a personal iPad, you could go and download the app. As long as you have an account to sign into, which we give to all the kids, you have access to it. Otherwise, it's just web-based. Get to it from any anything that has a web browser. So they're going to have a, how many different user credentials are they going to end up having? <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> just one. <laughs> That's going to be the same as their Google one then? Well, actually, I would say no, it's going to be two. <laughs> it's going to be two because Apple has gotten so strict with all of their accounts. Um, this one and Google will be the same, and those will match up. So their email, their Google Drive, Google Apps, eBackpack. It's the same one they carry on No. 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 So they get a new account? They have to have a new account. Actually, I shouldn't refer to it. If they're using email, the Gmail. if they're using Gmail, that will remain the same, yes. And then this will match that. There's a, there's a problem with carrying over. The kids also have a computer login that they've probably had for third grade that's and fourth grade and that's fifth the one grade. Year, yes. Uh -huh. But what's the password? Do you know what the password is to get into the email? Mm. Okay. Yeah, the, the, email stuff, <laughs> the email stuff stays the same. Their computer logins, which they may also bring up and say, hey, when I was, when I was at Edgerton there, I was at Hills Quarters Elementary, this was my computer login, blah, blah, blah. We can't roll those into middle school. They, they have to change. Photo, too. The what? The Red Moto does. That I have no idea. That's set up by an our, individual teacher. Our teachers are, yeah. have tried really hard. They know the, the structure for the password, like the, yep. the sequence that we use, and they try really hard. If they make up the passwords, they do it. Like um, we use um, WISC <coughs> and guidance for the kids to you know, go 
go on and start their resume. Um, so we instructed the guidance teachers to use that same password, have the you know, so that they don't have to forget it over and over. In the beginning of the year, we made a password sheet for them. We had them take a picture of it to save it on their iPad. Then we told them to go home and put it somewhere safe. Um, you know, it's a lot of remembering, but I think not, I think there's actually three because Infinite Campus is different than its email and then its iTunes. So there's three passwords that they have to kind of learn. And the teachers all know the secret, so if the kids are sitting and, you know, I, I forget, what's my password for email? The teacher will remind them, you know, they know the secrets of how it works. And the stuff they use on a daily basis, and again, Edmodo could be an additional layer. It's not something we do, you know, school-wide or district-wide. Um, E-Backpack is pretty daily. Google stuff is pretty daily. Those are the same. And then the iTunes one, we can't make the same. There's, there's no way. Um, and so their iTunes is a special account. So, okay, that got a bunch of hands up. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Now, I was just, I just wanted to just jump back a second. In this scenario, like if they forgot their iPad at school and it's the weekend, yep. and we log on, whatever, you had said earlier that not all of the assignments and things that are being put on Google Calendar will show up in eDacPad. Correct. So you can run in. But you can still access Google from your home computer or your phone or you know any of those devices. But but understand like Google Calendar may have something where it could be a very traditional assignment like we did when we were in middle school and Google Calendar might say for social studies open your traditional textbook and read pages nine to twenty and answer three questions at the end and that's but the list is going to be in Google Calendar so it lets the student know and the parents know. That's what the assignment is. And then the next one might say for you know science class, download the worksheet that's in eBackpack and complete. Does very that make rarely sense? are the kids forgetting iPads. They, they're not forgetting <laughs> them all, they're they forget to charge them. They don't forget to bring them to school. Once in a while, I'll have to check out a spare to them. You know, I forgot at home, nobody's at home. I need a spare. The nice thing about me giving them a spare is they just log into this, they log into Google, all of their stuff is there. They, you know, we can log into iTunes if they need an app for the class. It's already been purchased. We just downloaded on that one, and then I wipe it clean at the end of the day. It's not, it's not the end of the world. But so it doesn't have passwords. Yeah, I don't see why you would. Then we'll show you should post. Will we get them from school, or will we have to get them from our child? Yeah, from the child. On roll, on roll out day. They are handed a sheet of paper. It says, here's your name and here's your stuff. And we try not to have any other records that anywhere else. I always say, I can get to that stuff and my department can through an administrative interface. But even that, we generally can't even see what their passwords are. We can only reset them. And we've asked them not to change from the standard that right. we've been using because there are times where I need to get into their account to see something or you know, whatnot. So. It's not a security risk. I mean, that's kind of in the face of, of everything I've been taught for uh, for electronic security stuff is you know, standardized passwords and that kind of thing are right. Really but we also got to look at what I mean. We're not keeping nuclear secrets here either. You know. No, but somebody can't get into somebody else's uh, iPad if it happens to be left in a classroom or something like that. They can get into not to imply that kids can be mischievous, but they can get into their their iPad since there can't be a pin. They can get onto their email if they know the standardized pattern of passwords that you don't want them to change, and they can send out a, a mass email obnoxiously that'll look like it's from them, but it's not. All right, but understand they have to know their initials, their birthday, their to, yeah, yeah oh, to, to, to get their password to get in. Now, if somebody, now the way we have these set up, and this is the nature of the iPad, if a kid leaves their iPad sitting here in the class and somebody else picks it up and walks away, yes, they can get into their email. I will tell you in Waukesha, my daughter's district, they are required to have passcodes. And what has happened more often than not in Waukesha is that a kid will grab your iPad and you try it so many times it locks you out. Yeah. And then the only way to get into it is for me to disable it, which means you lose everything on your iPad for me to reset it. Mm -hmm. So that caused, uh, to me, just for the one that has to reset the iPads and work with it, that seems like a bigger of a follow-up. You know, kids are goofing around, I'm going to try your password, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I tried so many times, you're locked out now. And those were one of those uh, big do not ever do this again kind of things from the other districts we went to. They started programs, they put in, they made everybody do the four digit pin codes kind of thing. 
and it's been such nightmares. They're like, never ever do this again. So what's the so they get so pin codes are a no no. But right. what about their unique a unique uh, a child changing their password for the event? Basically, we if we find out that they have a problem with that, we go back and change it back. Okay, so it's not a huge no no. Okay, that's. I mean, it's a it's a no no. I mean, we want the ability to get in there. And the only time we would but know if can, they'd ever change it if there was change, a discipline problem. But since you can change it as administrator, then it's right. not a big deal. It doesn't lock you out. Correct. Okay. Correct. So maybe for individual security purposes, a kid might want to put in his own. I would hope not. <laughs> we want them all on the same page. We should be able to get into their stuff easily without, you know, them making a call to Chris Comp or myself to try to reset stuff. Um, and it's only happened a couple times that we've had it. I mean, I, I think it kind of got brought up because obviously if, if there ever was some mischief, wouldn't, um, I mean, they're so smart with it when it comes to these things and they, okay, there's a formula of this and I'm going to pick on whoever and you know what, I'm going to delete something. Mm -hmm. I would think that that would be more probable than I have to, say you have to access the account or something. Like if I'm going to change the password, I'm going to do it with my child and I'm going to have it. If it's ever something different, I'm going to have to take an issue with it. Um, I would just hate that we have a situation where, oh, somebody deleted all my stuff, and I'm going, yeah, right. <laughs> well, <we're still> well <coughs> if, if everything all of a sudden vanishes, we're going to know that something's up. Not even that, but if, if they figure out how to get into your iPad and they change your password, and now you've disabled it, you've lost everything on. Oh, sure. We yeah. haven't had any problems yeah. like yeah. that yeah. that I know of. And you know, Mr. Gordon does all, you know, 98% of the discipline in the building, and Kath has been helping him a lot with the technology piece, but I can recall one time this year where a student got into another student's email and sent an email out saying that he liked some girl, um, pretending like he was the owner of the iPad. But we haven't had a whole lot of that going on. The kids really okay. have been good about respecting that sort of thing. I think they understand how much the iPad means to them and the value of the information they have on there. Um, I will tell you, we've had kids hide it on each other and then the teacher doesn't let them go class, you know, they hide pencil cases without iPad, so, you know, they tease each other and they hide it under a desk and then the teacher has to say, okay, well, we can't dismiss class because so-and-so hit. You know, they, they'll play silly things, but I don't think, at least this year, we've been lucky, there hasn't been very much um, deceitful behavior between the kids. They've been really very good with them. A couple dropped ones, mm -hmm. but other than that, it's one of them, you know, a parent put on a password and she forgot it, so... I had to reset all I had. You know, it's been a few here and there, but it, it's been a re, it's been far better experience than um, we anticipated. I anticipated, yeah. My only last question is, how are they? How are you teaching them to type on them? Because like it's little, so they can't. Are they more like text typing? Yes, thumbs typing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can you still plug? Yep. Like we have regular iPads where you can plug. Yeah. The keyboard into it? Can yep. they still do that? So, so here's what you can do. They got Bluetooth on them. Okay. Um, if you have a Bluetooth keyboard at home yeah. for another device, it should work. Okay. I'm not going to guarantee 100% compatibility. Um, what we have on there is that we had a lot of parents asking for this. Uh, and so we made available at a bulk discount rate, whatever we could get them for, you know, kind of thing, at the office. $13? $12? Yeah. $12, something like that. Relatively cheap Bluetooth keyboard, nothing special, but it works. And, and you guys can buy one through us if you want. You can go to Best Buy. Basically what I had is some parents that were a little technophobic saying, well, hey, Mr. Grant, we're nervous to go to Best Buy or Walmart and pick one that might not work. Okay, we'll have a supply of like 25 of them sitting in the office. You know, we're not gonna provide them because the thing was we ended up buying a whole bunch and we had about an eighth of the student population that purchased them. Yeah. Well, I figured the kids there, but like if they were to type out some long thing, right. it would be really, well, maybe, that, maybe it wouldn't be hard for them, but I would think it much easier since they're spending all this time in elementary school learning how to type. And we told, you know, all the teachers are concerned about that, and the teachers, especially in the English department of the high school, are so concerned about it right now, and, and teachers were at the middle school too, and the plain and simple fact is, if you're doing a longer paper, or as you get to high school, a research paper, this is not the appropriate device for that. We still have laptop carts. Yeah. We still have full computer labs all over the place. Um, you are still going to a traditional computer, but then they're also finding that because of this interactive learning and media-based presentations, 
We're not doing so many of those long papers anymore. There's still a time and a place, and then you need the right tool. The iPad is not the right tool for that. Three paragraphs, that's a good cutoff. Three paragraphs, that's great. You can thumb type it, and they're really fast. <laughs> Way faster than I am. Um, and after that, if you're going to go longer, then it's time to break out a traditional keyboard. With a classroom full of these, how do you tell them apart? Uh, a couple different ways. And we hopefully don't get to like ver method three and four because that means pulling the case apart. Um, when the kids get them and we go through setup during the day, in the settings there's an about feature and we have the kids title them in a very specific way. And that will actually become more important next year because that's how we will disseminate paid applications to them. And that's something that we will add on to the student training at the beginning of the year. Hey, remember how we had you name this in this very weird like WMS six dash last name with a code next to it? Don't change that because otherwise you won't get any of the paid apps that we're gonna send to you kind of thing. So that's number one easiest way to do it is to look at that. The next way is if kid would change it and wipe that out, we record when they arrive, we match up a serial number, an asset tag number, and the kid's name in an inventory system before they ever touch the iPads. So then we can look in the first screen yes. under general and it shows the serial number, we can match that to the kid's name. Or worse comes to worse, we can pull them completely apart and out of the case and then the serial number is engraved on the back, the asset tag is sitting there and we actually tag them with the kid's name on the back too. We do have them go and write with what we thought was going to be permanent, super permanent, we would never allow the kids to touch them ever other than on rollout day, Sharpie silver metallic <coughs> marker, and turns out that it rubs off. Um, so we actually have them write their names right directly on the cases. And we will do that again next year, but depending on how much friction the kid puts it through, it rubs off anywhere from a week to six months. I would just keep reminding your child, do you have your name on it? Um, these covers, We've been saying no stickers because okay. there's been problems with it at other, again, we're learn, trying to learn from okay. other districts where they let the kids put some stickers on, not necessarily from a label maker, and the stuff, you need acid to get it off, you know, and so we're trying to keep the equipment fairly clean and everything. <laughs> um, the, all the supplies the kids need are available throughout the year. So if they find out, you know, eight weeks in and their name is rubbing off over the two pieces of the case, the silver markers are there. They're available for the teachers. They can grab them from the library. You know, they're locked up where the, the teachers can get them though. Same thing with cleaner and everything else. One of the big things we say is don't use a household cleaner. You can destroy an iPad with that. And Windex, I love Windex on my windows. It's horrible for electronics. Um, that cleaner that we guarantee is not gonna destroy the equipment is at school for them. They just, you know, talk to the teachers. Hey, let's do a Friday next week and let's have a cleaning day for 10 minutes. And the teachers can get these spray cans and stuff like that and rag. Why don't you guys just put the name inside the case where it's not going to get any hand use? It is. Right, right. on the inside of the case? That's well, no, the name's the actually on the iPad inside the case. Like, and it still runs protected. off. No, not that one. That one's okay. stays. No, but that's a good idea on the cover. Like, yeah, 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 on the inside that, of the That's what I did for all my yeah. lips, though. And then it's yeah. in there. Yes? With the uh, iCloud account or Apple, would you be able to FaceTime and download? They can as long as they're within that content restriction, so that 13 and younger restriction, <coughs> they could download once the app store is open. So FaceTime is a separate piece. So yes, once we turn FaceTime on, they would be able to video chat, you know, with anybody that has the iTunes account kind of thing. Um, the apps, there is no way to just turn games on and off. It's either the app store is open or it's closed. I think, and I don't want anybody to say this is set in stone yet, I think we're gonna turn the app store off at the start of the year, but then the grade level teams will decide when it's open, because they'll need access to it at some point to get new new apps and content. Will they be able to iMessage each other? Uh, same thing, it, I would imagine it's gonna be shut down at the beginning of the year, that's a separate, it's a separate entity that we can turn on and off remotely. 
Um, we'll have it turned off, and then, you know, if it's deemed appropriate by the grade level teachers, we would turn it on. It is right now, currently it's our policy that the kids have it off during the day. So we do random iPad checks where I go around and grab them, and if it's not turned off, um, depending on how many times I told them to turn it off during the day, you know, it could be a yellow slip or some sort of, you know, PBIS or just a reminder, but they, it, because it is on and, you know, we don't have it shut off for everybody, that's our, they are to turn that off as soon as they come into the building. And then that way they don't get notifications if people are messaging them, it's not a distraction, there's nothing, you know, no bubbles coming up saying somebody messaged you, please open it now. Um, it's just a good habit to get into, just like you turn your phone on silent when you came in here. That was, you know, just good behavior. So those are the types of things we want to teach. You didn't? Well, I'm going, I'm oh. hot. like I give you my phone, I don't even know how to turn it off. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, how can you even do this? So, um, I'm sorry, what did you turn off? The iMessaging, it's just like texting each other through the iStacks. Um, so we found real quick in the beginning of the year, oh, this is a little distracting. <laughs> They're texting each other. Let's go through that. So we had to then teach them. Okay, so we're going to turn it off. Like the, the, the phone now, and I'm not going to lie, you know, I taught many of years, and they still were texting in my class just with their phone. You know, they were passing notes with pencil and paper. So this is the new age yeah. of note passing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so you know just, the teachers just had to come up with, just be a little bit more savvy and make sure we teach them. Classroom management has become different. Um, you know, we knew that we would have different problems, and that's been one of the things that we've, you know, they're not expecting it, but, but we didn't expect it. So um, that has been the bulk of our our, cons our office referrals is just you know kids using the technology when they shouldn't be inappropriately when they shouldn't be. So you know we're getting better at that, and that's one of the things we're going to look at this this summer is the three strikes are out, what's that going to look like? Um, and it really has been a small percentage of students. It's it's not every child doing it. it you know, we have, just like with any other discipline, we have our repeat offenders who take up a lot of Mr. Borden's time. But the vast majority of kids are using it appropriately and being respectful. Before the iPads, they were sleeping in class, now they'd be playing games. Before they were right. sending paper messages, now they're sending text. It's just a different issue. How about any um, like issues with copying of homework and stuff? I mean, obviously that was plagiarism, things like that. Is it, again, it's, it's just different now. It's, it's, it's different. Same it's thing that we had going on when we were school. You want to talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah. We, We've had a couple incidents. We did have a couple, and one was just recently. That's why I kind of both snickered. Um, our teachers are really good at, well, they now are very savvy at catching it. Um, we had one, well, not one, we had 18 people turn in the same project. Nice. Um, it's it's I, will, <laughs> yeah. I will say they weren't real smart about it. Yeah, I mean, and a little on the stupid side, too. None of them changed any of the words. Same and um, even one kid left yes. the other kid's name on it. In the same <laughs> teacher. So, uh, you know, it's, it, we laugh about it, but we didn't do a, we typically always talk about plagiarism when they write papers, and you know, it was just one of those projects, the teacher, it was, they had to research all these things, and the teacher all of a sudden was looking at him and looking at him, and holy cow, and I mean, so it, there was a lot of punishment to go along with that incident, um, and a lot of learning, a lot of teaching after that, and thank God it happened when they were in eighth grade, not when they were in high school or in college, because, you know, that type of plagiarism gets you kicked out. So um, that is one thing we are definitely adding to. On the last page there, you have that agreement the kids signed off on. Um, as far as iPad expectations, we're adding plagiarism and um, you know copying others' work. We're going to add that. We're going to do a little bit more in the beginning of the year about that because you're right. They can quickly email the work to each other, send it off as their own. That's one of the things I was going to ask. If they're using a Litno email, we can check. They might delete it, but it's still maybe there. So yeah, we actually there's kind of a, tell them, hey, if you email something, yeah. it's always there. Yeah, within and, and they and we make them aware of that within a district email system like that by law, we actually have to archive everything. Mm -hmm. So we have it for years. So they open a different email. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> that's right. Exactly. There's always a way. Yeah. And you then know. you tell them it's the school's iPad. I can look. Mm -hmm. They can through the elementary grades, but at middle school that shifts. Okay. And so they, it is just like you so and I would. So it's pretty much everything open, and including the, the FaceTime and everything else is to access 
not just to the I-5 pads inside the district, it's anywhere that they would have to be. Correct. I mean, certain things like FaceTime, again, we can disable that. You know, we will probably have that disabled at the start of the year, but email does shift. That was a conscious decision that our technology committee made. That was actually, we didn't even have the student email system in yet. We were talking about it and looking at the long range plans. And we made a very conscious decision to make that fifth, sixth grade split right there. Um, again, talking to other districts, you know, what they were doing. So yeah, the elementary schools are closed. It's a closed system. It has to be a teacher or a staff member and, or kids. Um, but that changes, so they, they are open to the world. Like you could email them now to that email system um, once they you know get up to next year and, and everything kicks in there next year. Um, so yeah, that is a shift. But like any educational system, we're 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 not a regular Google app. So if you know you, me, whoever goes into Google Apps and signs up for it for a free account, that's different. That's the public side. We're under the educational realm kind of thing. So while there isn't a lot of oversight, everything is recorded, everything is kept, you know, and there, there's a way to dig into that. Um, it's not easy, but we can. <laughs> Anybody else? Is the pin option disabled for them so they can't put a pin on there? There is no way to disable that. I didn't think so. Right, so we tell them, they you know, they actually right see it. Yeah, it's like well, it's, it's on there. We make a big deal about it because I can't tell you what a nightmare this yeah. was in other districts. I mean, where they said literally their program ground to a halt yeah. because pin codes were going in, kids were forgetting them, or parents were putting them in, and kids couldn't get in, and it became a, a nightmare. And it wasn't just one or two districts. I traveled to 16 different districts as we were researching this over the last couple of years, and almost everybody thought right away, oh, let's restrict and put this pin in there it's for security and blah, blah, blah turned into such a nightmare to a T. Everybody said, don't ever, ever do this. And so we grabbed this, this is from Milton, so a lot of that child sign-off sheet you see and also the parent sign-off sheet, those are really Milton School District documents. They said, you can have them, use them, we have no problem with that. They've proven that they work. I mean, the, everybody goes to see these guys, they really know what they're doing. And uh, you know, they said, don't ever set a pin code in there. It, it's a real nightmare. So. You know, again, first strike, kid comes in with a pin code, we say, all right, we're gonna have to reset this, because if they can't remember it, our only way to do it then is to completely wipe out the iPad. Now, most of the stuff is saved up in the cloud, e-backpack stuff, no big deal, saved up in e-backpack. Google Drive, no problem. But if the kid does have some stuff saved directly on their iPad, mostly it's just pictures. It's generally the only concern we have. Email's not a problem either. They're gonna lose that stuff. It's gonna be wiped out. So the pictures don't sync up to Google? They don't. They can put them in there if they want. They can, you know, manually have to hit share out the Google Drive, but they don't by default, no. And it won't be stored with iCloud, like iCloud. Like the stream? Like yeah, the stream. yeah, yeah, the backup stuff and everything, the photo stream, we don't have them turn that stuff on kind of thing. Um, the, uh, the backup space is not big enough. I mean, these teachers are jumping into this stuff right away, and so, you know, if you're familiar with iCloud, you get five gigs of backup space free. That's not big enough to back up these iPads. All right, almost early on, the apps are going to be too large to do that. So, yeah. we ask them to back up pages, keynote, and numbers. So a lot of our kids are yep. typing in pages, and so those ones go through the cloud. Yep. Um, if a student who isn't paying attention in the beginning when we set it up and doesn't flip that little document on, they lose all their pages. To, um, you know, so I every time I pick up an iPad, that's one of the first things I look at. Our biggest thing we've had issues with is kids snapping pictures of non-academic stuff, where it also the kid will come run up to their teacher. You know, we had some already. I think by the end of September already, where they were like, "Mine's full." And again, it was just a couple of kids. And we had to look at them and say, "Hmm, let's have a look at that." You know, oh, your 2,000 photos that have nothing to do with your classes, <laughs> those need to go. You know, and so now it's been a habit of just reminding them over and over and saying, "Hey." 
You want to take a couple pictures that are non-academic, as long as you're not violating the policies, like take them in the bathroom, that's a big one. And we got to teach them that. We have big signs on the doors. Um, you know, take a few photos. We're okay with that. Learn how to use it, but the rest is for class. Um, one other thing I just want to brought because we kind of touched on it and then moved away. And again, if you guys got to go, go. Um, there is a spot in there on that contract that talks about letting you use your kids or your children using your own iTunes account. Um, we did have a couple issues with this this year. We're not restricting that. If you as a parent choose to sign out of their account and sign in with your account, basically it came down to kids wanted to get games or whatever on weekends. They had the iPad at home, talked to mom and dad, because the accounts they get from us are only good for free apps. They're student accounts. They have no credit card attached to them. You can only get free apps with them unless we assign them a paid app. And so they signed out and mom and dad let them use their account. Understand, at that point, if you let them use your account, your account has different rights and privileges than a student account, right? And it's attached to your credit card, so number one, just a warning, be careful with that, spread the word. Um, some parents forgot that they had given it to their kid and it was signed in there and the kid was buying stuff. Um, and the other one we had, you know, I had a couple parents come to me and I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Kik, K-I-K. <laughs> Really, really, really bad app you never want a child near, ever. I'm just saying that as the tech guy. Um, take social media into the dark, deep levels that we never even want to think about. Front page, you know, newspaper, magazines, you, yeah. I don't want to go there. And so I had a couple of parents come to me and say, you know, my kid's using Kick, and I've heard this is really bad. It's been written up in the news and blah, blah, blah. You know, it makes Facebook look, a little, look like a little angelic app kind of thing. Um, it's really bad, you guys. And when we dove into it with these three kids, it turns out, well, the parents put their account in and weren't watching, and then the kid now can get to the over 17 adult content because they're under that different account. As long as they're in with our account we give them, they'll have that 13 and under restriction on there. So just, you know, again, it's one of those things, we can't stop you from doing it, but you might want to think twice. We did have a couple of issues with it, and then the parents were like, oh, okay, yeah, and we got those accounts out of there. Fun. So if you put the account in, you can just log out as soon as you've done the download. Correct. Right? Yes. And then after that, you don't right. have to worry. About it. And you don't have to worry about yeah. it. So again, if you're that parent who's there and says, you know, my kid wants, you know, this little 99 cent game app. We're going on a trip to Chicago. And it's a long road trip or whatever for the weekend. Sure, sign in with your account. You know what the password is. Download the app. Kid now has access to it. But then sign out as soon as you're done. Well, that's nice. And you get prompted 12 part. times. Yeah. At least you're yeah, it's the signing out part, and that, you know, that's just, it's, as parents, you kind of got to get up a little bit with the technology and the management, and be careful how much power you give to your kids at that point, point. and these were just where the kid, the parents were like, oh, I can't believe I didn't do that, and I let my kid just run wild, you know, kind of thing, so, and you know, again, we'll, we'll try to work with you and help you through that and everything, it's a learning curve for everybody. Those of you that are worried because you feel like your kids are going to be more tech savvy than you and you're worried about all this, you can feel free to contact me or Eric one of us at any time and just say, you know, this or this is going on, should it be going on, or mm -hmm. hey, what should I know, what do you know about this? Because through an email, pretty quickly, we could probably respond to you, or I'm happy to meet with parents at any time to help kind of educate and work through it. It's, it's not as scary as it seems, yeah. especially with the sixth graders getting it when it's going to be pretty much locked down. They're not going to be able to do anything at first. That gives you a couple weeks to kind of just get used to what they should be doing as class in class. I respond to a lot of parent emails every week. Email me though, please, don't call me. You'll never get a call back, I'm sorry. <laughs> call me, send me an email, you'll get that back. But I will say, it was from parent emails actually in the parent survey that we put out in January. We actually found a flaw in security. A really, really bizarre one. It took us days to figure it out, but we figured it out. We got a few kids that got on Snapchat. You ever heard of Snapchat? Again, not a good place for kids to be. Um, and I had a couple parents, and then I had one particularly tech-savvy parent. I was able to call this gentleman and talk to him about it, and he said, I'm telling you, my kids get into this. I don't know how, and I think he's doing it at school. His son. We were able to track down and figure out that if you followed 16 weird, bizarre steps, and you had parent help, and you did it this way, yeah, you could get the Snapchat here at Whitman. And we thought we had it completely blocked up. We found, the kids found a loophole. So yes, they're very, whoever asked about that, you know, tech savvy kids, they found a way that if they downloaded under their parents' account 
and they signed in at home on an unrestricted network first, because again, their, their account would let them through it, and then they brought the account from home, activated in the morning before it would sign automatically back out again, and brought it to school right away, then they could still get the Snapchat. They're good. They're not happy with me now because we blocked it. <laughs> I guess my concern is more on if they are able to do some games and things, is that at times if the kid is at home and he's supposed to be doing his homework mm -hmm. and he doesn't get it done when parents aren't available to be restricted if he's playing a game that he should be doing his homework. And then if when it's time to do the homework, it's too late. It's, it's in the night or whatever. So I don't know if that's... Well, you know, it's, it's the same challenge we all face. I mean, I'll admit, my poor mother, I was a procrastinator all the way through middle school and into early high school, and I'd come up with anything I could as an excuse to not do my work. Right. Didn't matter, I didn't have an electronic device sitting right there. You know, it could be anything. I'd bounce a ball against the wall as long as it well, yeah, kept I mean, me from doing my homework. My son can find three different devices at home to try to right. do something else than to do homework. It's, it's the same issue, different, yep. different mode of looking at it. I will say we'll come out with a couple um, tech tips, perhaps. Like, um, you know, if you double hit the home button on an iPad, it shows you the most recent apps that they've been doing. So we we just started in January, probably doing this with our teachers. You know, the, the kids will say, well, I was playing that game at lunch, I swear. And it's like, yeah, no, you weren't. So now when the kids come into the classroom, they have to double hit the home button, clear everything out. So essentially nothing's open. And the only thing that they should have open then in that class is whatever the teacher tells them. So we'll give those tips to you guys so that, you know, when your son or daughter's on the couch saying, I'm writing a paper, you can come over then double hit the home button and if, you know, Flappy Fish comes up, well, you weren't really writing your paper. Because they are quick at going back and forth. Um, but, no, but that's why, you know, those types of tips, you know, we'll probably put up on the website saying, you know, if you want to check or, you know, what they've been doing to kind of help you with those things. Well, like our family rule has just been, when you go to bed, they're like, try to stay in the kitchen. Yes. Or and it's going to switch to our and, room soon. And, it's not going to be the kitchen. And that's a great but rule to have. Watch, there's no reason for it to be in their room at night. Yep. No reason. You know, I go, I go around and do the internet safety talks around the community and everything. Yeah. I tell any parent, any parent, I don't care if it's a mobile phone, an iPad, yeah, yeah. a laptop, or whatever. Until you decide what that magic age is, and that's up to you as a family to decide, everything stays in a common area of the house. It should yeah. never go to a bedroom or something like that. You know, but again, that's up to you and your families, and you know, not me to say, but that's just a good safety rule of thumb. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you. We'll hang around for a couple minutes if you got personal questions or something, but thank you very much for coming, you guys. Much thank appreciated. You.